Hello and welcome to another episode of the Life After Cardiac Arrest podcast with me, your host, Paul Swindell. Today I'm joined by a regular on our show, Dr. Tom Keeble. Welcome, Tom. How you doing? <laughs> I'm good, thanks. And uh, how are you doing? Yeah, no, I'm good. I've had a busy on call, but uh, I'm, I'm feeling very able to talk about what we're uh, engaging in today. So that's great news. Okay, just to give us a little insight into your life, what what is on call about? What's a, what's a cardiologist have to do these days? Well, there's a number of different types of cardiologists, and I'm an interventional cardiologist. And out of hours, so after sort of the normal working hours of eight till six, when I'm on call, we'll take all heart attacks from the whole of Essex and slightly beyond, so a population of around two million people, uh, and we will do around on average two to three heart attacks per day. And again, they're like London buses. You'll go a, a couple of nights where you'll be in bed doing nothing. And then you'll have a night like last night when I did four cases pretty much back to back. And you can't quite, uh, we don't know quite why, but that's just how it works sometimes. And so the patients will come from their home having often had chest pain and the ambulance uh, will do an ECG and they will bring them to the cardiac centre in Essex, where I will then get called to open the artery up within 30 minutes so that we can minimise the amount of heart damage that the blocked artery can do. That yeah, sounds uh, pretty hectic. <laughs> well, it's just and, random. It's very random. And when it's busy, it's it's crazy busy. And when it's pleasant, it's uh, it's not too bad at all. But the trouble is you can't plan anything. Obviously, you have to plan that you're going to be busy regardless. So your life has to slightly go on hold when you're on call, which is only a one in 12. So it, I can't uh, – it's not like in the old days when it was one in two or three. It's, it's, a, it's a relatively reasonable rotor. Mm-hmm. Is, there, is there any sort of patterns to when people have heart attacks? So, yes, uh, there's more in the winter and there's more uh, on a Monday morning. Uh, uh, and there's very clear frequency indicators that do change slightly. We don't quite fully understand why. There is a feeling there may be some viral or sort of immune type effect where a virus induces a sort of pro-inflammatory state that makes people more susceptible to a sort of clotting in the coronary artery and an excitability of the narrowing of an artery, which is often modest. Often people will have it in the night and then try and go back to sleep. And then when it's still there in the morning, call an ambulance. So there's elements to that. And the classic one is on Christmas Day, actually, where everyone calls an ambulance at around five o'clock because they think it's indigestion from the turkey at three o'clock. Uh, so there's, there's, there's different sort of patterns of variation. But then in between times, it can be completely random. Yeah, we, we, I know there's a, a, quite a few in there, a group are all around the Christmas time. But, uh, and, we, and we don't we don't necessarily fully understand that. Maybe people are tired and run down. There's viral stuff banging around at Christmas because everyone mixes them up and down the country with loved ones over Christmas time. And I think that's probably not coincidence. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree. Okay, well, you sort of touched on um, what we were going to talk about today, um, and that was about what happens in the cath lab because I know you spend quite a bit of your time in there. And I've been in there and a couple of times. Uh, once, uh, I believe, when I was first brought in, when I had my cardiac arrest, and then later on um, to have my ICD implanted. Um, and what I thought was that I don't actually know what actually happened to me when I was in there. And I know there's a number of procedures uh, that go on. And I just thought perhaps we can uh, talk about the cath lab. So. Yeah, no, of course. Well, I think you beautifully separate the two reasons to go to a cath lab in what you just said. And that is, number one, going to a cath lab acutely. So as an emergency, uh, of course, of which a cardiac arrest is an ultimate emergency. And the second time you went to the cath lab was obviously as a sort of elective planned procedure when you went there, usually conscious and having given a consent to do something and have a procedure that you're anticipating performed often before discharge. Um, but I think we'll probably focus on the emergency side because I think that's probably the bit that most of your uh, listeners have or well, don't remember anything about because they were often asleep or, or certainly semi comatose during that period. Before we go into actually what you do in there, could you sort of just describe what a cath lab is? You know, can you uh, sort of tell me what equipment you've got in there? And, and, you know, do all hospitals have a cath lab? 
Yeah, so all cardiac centres have a catheter lab, uh, and often three, four, five. Bart's has eight, I think. We have five at the cardiac centre in Essex, um, and they do different things um, for different specialities. But in essence, a catheter lab is a bit like a, an operating theatre in that it's quite a sterile environment because a lot of the procedures that we do require us to, to be sterile and have gloves and, and, and masks and uh, and gowns on because obviously when we're puncturing the skin there is a theoretical risk of infection for the patient which we need to be very mindful of so it's essentially a sterile uh, theater but instead of just having a bed or an operating table like it would in a in a, in a theater uh, it also has lots of pieces of equipment to guide procedures the most important piece of equipment that most of us use is an x-ray machine. And again, rather than just taking still x-ray pictures, it takes what's called cines or angios, where you can take moving images of things, which is what we're interested in. And that usually entails moving images of the heart muscle or moving images of the heart arteries, as they are the major problems that we face following a cardiac arrest that we can treat. Um, in addition to a table and x-ray machine that can take moving pictures, we also have access to lots of equipment, uh, which involves tubes into uh, putting tubes down into the into the wind uh, food pipe and into the uh, breathing uh, lungs so that we can breathe for patients safely. We have a ventilator to keep patients breathing while they're asleep and while they're comatose. We have access to temperature management where we can cool the patients down or keep them at a steady temperature. Uh, we have access to ultrasound guidance of certain components and an ultrasound of the heart called an echocardiogram. And so, uh, and of course, the patient is constantly monitored by a physiologist. And if they have another cardiac arrest or another episode of VT or VF, uh, which is quite a common presenting rhythm, then we can shock the patient back to normal rhythm, which is a very common thing for us to have to do. So I think what I'm trying to paint a picture of is a sterile environment where we've got a, a team of individuals and we the team generally consists of around five or six individuals, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, who have very specific jobs to make our patients safe and to deliver them the best possible investigation and treatment. Mm -hmm. uh, it sounds quite high tech to me. I mean, the, the fact that you've got uh, x-ray machines in there, does that pose uh, that you're taking essentially moving pictures with, does that pose a risk to you or the patient? Yes, so very little to the patient because it's a one-off dose to the patient and all of the dose the patient receives is monitored. Uh, and so if it goes beyond a certain limit, we are made aware of that. But it's very, very unusual for the patient to have radiation problems. The most common thing is they can, with very excessive radiation, get a sort of rash or like a sunburn almost in a way. But it, it, we really never see it. Um, it's much more troublesome to the operators and the nursing staff and the radiographers and the physiologists because, of course, we're doing this either every day or every couple of days and exposed on a daily basis to these uh, these radiation, extra radiations, which are monitored on badges that we have uh, on our on our um, on our person. One just on the thyroid shield, which protects our thyroid and one uh, in our clothing under our lead apron. So during procedures, we all wear lead aprons, which obviously protect us from the x-rays uh, to protect predominantly our our thyroid and then obviously our chest and abdomen and sort of legs and we wear it like a sort of a long skirt in a way that goes all the way from our shoulders right down to just below our knees and there are also a variety of uh, other x-ray protection pieces that go around the patient to sort of stop all the scatter uh, but it's a very, very real concern. Uh, and, you know, if we're doing this for 30 or 40 years, like it's likely that we will be, there unfortunately is an increased risk of cancers, particularly head and neck and brain. Uh, and so that is a, a sad but real consequence of the work that we do. Hmm. Oh, that, I've, I didn't really realise that at all. So it's quite shocking, really, that you, you, you guys are putting yourself in the front line in that way. So... 
um, I take my hat off to you for for that for the personal. The, the trouble is, it's a bit of a silent killer. You can imagine it's not going to yeah. kill me tomorrow, but it might kill me in twenty five years with a you know a tumor somewhere which might have come anyway. But at the same time, if you're exposed every day to the and the predominant brain tumors are on the left hand side, which is where the cameras generally are situated where we do cases. Mm-hmm. So, so there is definite causation. It's not a it's not scientific fiction. Mm-hmm. Well, let's hope technology will improve such that it'll be able to doing a, do it in a different way in the future. I think that is possible. You know, it is possible, of course. Okay, so um, before we we uh, started talking, I, I mentioned a couple of the things that I thought went on in in the um, in the cath lab. So p- perhaps you could sort of tell us about those. Oh, actually, just before I go on to that. I was going to say, of the patients that come into the the cath lab for um, who've had a cardiac arrest, what state are they usually in? Yeah, so uh, a minority will be conscious or semi-conscious. So we know that you can have a cardiac arrest, often a VF cardiac arrest, and if you get very prompt CPR and very prompt defibrillation, maybe uh, by a, a defibrillator in, in, the, in the street or in a gym or wherever you happen to be, you can have a loss of consciousness for such a short period of time that you can regain consciousness as soon as your, your heart starts again. Often patients are a little sort of bewildered and a bit sort of shocked and a bit sort of taken aback and confused and muddled where you can imagine why they would be but at the same time you can have a conversation with patients that is a minority i would say less than five percent um the other 95 percent uh usually have had a a, a downtime we call a downtime where the heart has not beated for maybe 10 15 20 25 minutes and i think you've polled your group previously our our average time of no no flow to the brain from the heart is 23 minutes in all comers to our institution and if you have a no flow time of 23 minutes apart from just cpr then you almost invariably will be comatosed and then when paramedics and maybe the other air ambulance doctors arrive, you will generally be uh, put to sleep to keep you comfortable and to put a tube down and breathe for you. And I think that's really, really important. So the vast majority of our patients after a cardiac arrest come to us being uh, in a comatose situation. So they're not awake. They are purposefully kept to sleep uh, with a tube down, which is doing the breathing for them so that that bit of work and that concern is taken out of the uh, out of the equation. Mm hmm. Okay, thanks for for putting us in the picture with that. And uh, it's quite sort of um, not shocking, but because I, I know from my poll, but that that twenty three minutes wasn't it? Uh, that's quite a long time, really, isn't it? It is a long time, but I think it just shows that you know we have a survival rate of around sixty five percent of all comers that get to our centre with an output. Sixty five percent will go home with a good neurological outcome as we measure it currently, that's to be debated as to what a good neurological outcome looks like. And I know that patients uh, who have suffered this will have a big question mark about that. But um, as we measure it currently, uh, yeah, out of of those patients with a mean of 23 minutes downtime, 65% will go home. So it just shows the real power of incredibly good CPR and identification of a cardiac arrest problem and treatment as best you can in in both the community and then coming to a cardiac centre like ours. Mm -hmm. So it shows that when when the chain of survival is right, you know, you you do get really good results you certainly can i mean the other thing to say obviously a mean of 23 minutes is our and it's pretty rock solid our mean it's it's been the same every year for the last three years um you know and then you only have to look at some high profile cases like fabrice Mwamba was 78 minutes and we've had an amazing uh, few cases where we've had upwards of an hour and certainly up to 90 minutes where excellent cpr either delivered by a uh, community first responders or people in the street or by mechanical CPR devices, which the ambulance now carry, which can do CPR in a sort of mechanical way. Because as many people may have uh, realized, doing CPR is remarkably tiring. Uh, And most of us can probably only do it effectively 
for anything between three and five minutes, after which time we really do fatigue and do it less well. And so it's really important to do CPR uh, if you can, if you can, as part of a team, uh, taking it in turns because it's really, really hard work. Mm -hmm. It's a good point. That's the uh, the pit crew method they use, isn't it, for between the ambulance crews? Exactly right. Okay, so so you've got um, let's say that most of the patients are going to come in as uh, comatose. Then, so what do you do first? Is it would that be the angiogram? Well, I think the first thing we always do is we assess the patient just outside in a holding bay where we have a handover. And this is probably the most important part of the procedure, actually, where the paramedic crew, often the air ambulance crew and any other skilled bystanders need to give us the history and the story of what actually happened to the patient. And for me, this is the bit that sometimes gets skirted over a little bit, but for me is by far the most important thing. So with all due respects, if you have someone who is completely unwitnessed and was just found and maybe could have had no heartbeat for maybe 30 or 40 minutes, for instance, we know that sadly the outcome of that is almost always going to be poor and the patient will not survive. And depending on what we find on the ECG, which looks at the heart rhythm and whether we think there is a heart attack or not, we make a judgment call as to what benefits patients will receive from certain interventions. So we do have to have a judgment call clinically led as to how we think we should best treat the patient. Mm -hmm. That also goes for patients who may have known cancers, but was not known at the time of the collapse. And maybe they are in the last few weeks or months of their life and that actually the cardiac arrest was just an end point of their life rather than because the trouble is when people collapse in the street, you often don't know this information. And of course, the patient can't necessarily volunteer it. So we just have to take stock of all of the information that we can find and have to hand from bystanders, from neighbours, from family, from other people who were there, just to make sure that what we're doing for this patient is in their best interests. And obviously ensuring that they don't have some sort of preconceived plan that maybe they didn't want resuscitation, but someone gave it to them. And you can imagine you can get into some difficulties if you don't assess all of the information first. So it just it's it it can be quite a challenging scenario when you're making decisions with often quite limited information and of course as the lead of the team which is usually the consultant cardiologist we have to with our team just make the best decisions with the information that we have available to us and we get it right most of the time but assuming of course that the patient didn't have any pre predetermined plans and that the patient wanted to be resuscitated and that this is someone who does not have a life uh, um, curtailing illness that we know about, um, then the reason why the catheter lab is then the next place to go is that it allows us to investigate and treat the patient in the best possible way. So if you're to contrast the way we do things nowadays at the Essex Cardiac Centre with what happened, for instance, 10 years ago, the contrast would be that now you very often or more often get CPR in the community, we hope. You more often get shocks from an AED or a defibrillator in the community. And then you more often come to a cardiac centre like ours rather than an A&E department. Uh, because you can imagine while an A&E department has some of the things, it really doesn't have everything that we've just described previously and that I'll go on to describe now. So once we've assessed that we should take the patient to the catheter lab, the first thing that happens is that the team moves the patient down there and the team includes an anaesthetist who's looking after the ventilation and often the blood pressure and heart rhythm, a nurse to assist the anaesthetist, and then a sort of technical support person for the anaesthetist too. So they generally have a team of three. There's then a consultant cardiologist who's usually uh, the lead uh, interventional person with a registrar who's another fairly senior doctor. Then there'll be a physiologist who's looking after the defibrillator and after the, the rhythm and the saturations. 
a radiographer who's looking after the x-rays and then either one or two cardiac catheter lab nurses. So the team for a cardiac arrest patient is around about 10 people. And believe you me, when patients are incredibly poorly and cardiac arrest patients are pretty much the most poorly patients that we see, you need all of those individuals to all have a predetermined role. And that actually we're very calm, we're very succinct and you know when you ask for something or when someone else comments on something you need to have a team approach that works instantaneously together uh, for the good of the patient and that sounds a bit sort of uh, yeah it sounds a bit naff but it's so true cardiac arrest teams are what make survival a, a, a thing that is that is achievable it's not one individual it really is working together and I cannot underestimate the importance of that mm-hmm. I think that you quite often see that or when I've watched TV programs that have shown operations and uh, emergency situations and things like that, it always amazes me how calm the, the doctors are and the, the other professionals that are with them. And, uh, yeah, it's it's amazing, really, that you, you can work under such stress and pressure uh, like that. So I take my hat off to you guys. Well, I think, to be fair, I, I would – put it the other way uh, for me i don't get stressed at all about cardiac arrest patients because they have been in a much worse state before they got to me does that make sense yeah. and so i actually find i get more concerned and worried by my elective patients that walk in talk to me and i'm doing something in a planned way which if i run into problems is much more challenging for me to deal with. Whereas this patients with cardiac arrest are, of course, the sickest patients I'm ever going to see. And if I do nothing, then probably the outcome is going to be a bad one. But if I can do something positive, then I can change that into a good outcome. And that for me is what's rewarding because we have to appreciate, as you and all your listeners well know, unfortunately, the survival rate, even in the best centers of people coming to hospital is around 50 percent in general. Uh, And so we know that we can't save everybody currently. And until things change, you know, we need to make a multitude of system changes to improve that number. Okay, so if you've got a patient that you feel like you you can um, do some interventions, is that when when you go to the angiogram? And if if can you tell me what an angiogram is? Yeah, of course. So the patient goes onto the table, we we go through patients' uh, treatment plans in a very structured way. And the way we do that is A, B, C, D, E. Uh, so A is airway uh, and access. And so the first priority is to make sure your anaesthetist and the ventilator are happy. And that sounds a silly thing to say, but you can imagine if you're struggling to oxygenate and ventilate someone's brain, there's no point in starting a complicated procedure because you haven't got the basics right. So the first thing is to make sure the airway and the breathing are good and that your anaesthetist is happy. And that's a really important uh, part. The next uh, part is access. And what we do with access is obviously we need to get tubes into their arteries and veins so that we can firstly deliver drugs to their veins. And we tend to put quite big tubes either into the groin or into the uh, neck veins just because they're big veins that we can deliver quickly drugs into. The next thing we think about is of, is uh, is blood pressure and circulation. So if you've got a blood pressure of 60 over 30, you are not perfusing anything very well and you need to work on, number one, why that is, and number two, of course, try and make it better and work with your anaesthetist and your physiologist and your nurses to make that better. And part of that uh, involves uh, putting tubes into the arteries and it's normally the artery in the forearm the radial artery and passing tubes up to the heart so that we can inject dye down a coronary artery and understand if there are any blockages now my personal view on this is is that i think everybody who has a cardiac arrest uh, from a so uh, probable cardiac cause should have an angiogram. An angiogram is a very simple, quick and relatively low risk procedure. And I'm much more comfortable if the coronaries are completely pristinely normal. I know that there's not a problem that I don't know about. And I'd much rather know that things are good and that the coronaries are clean of significant disease so I can cross that one off the list. 
Or, of course, if there is a problem and one of the arteries is either incredibly narrowed or is blocked, and that is the cause of the cardiac arrest, a heart attack causing the cardiac arrest, then, of course, I can treat that artery, which one would suspect should make the outcome and the prognosis better from the heart perspective, because you're going to make the heart attack be smaller. There are, however, some slightly or well, slightly, there are important differences between heart attacks in cardiac arrest patients and heart attacks in conscious patients that we need to be mindful of. Uh, and that really comes down to the fact that when we have uh, heart attack stenting uh, in patients ha- who have had a cardiac arrest, it can be very difficult for us to get the drugs on board and for them to absorb them uh, to make stenting favourable. Um, and secondly, um, we can see more stents blocking off, which can be a problem for patients too. And so stenting in the setting of a cardiac arrest does have some challenges, and we do need to be mindful of drug absorption and the higher rates of stent blockage, which can cause an adverse outcome. So we just need to be mindful of these things. Mm-hmm. And uh, why, why would those um, why would cardiac arrest patients be different in that situation? Is it just because of the state that they're in? Yeah, I think you have to remember that they they will have had often a lot of adrenaline. Their gut will be shut down. They will often be shocked, and they will not absorb the drugs that you give into the stomach, like a patient who is. Uh, awake and conscious and talking to you. So the very drugs that we give to make the blood a bit thinner and to make the blood less sticky simply don't get to adequate concentrations because of the fact that the absorption is not good enough. The second thing is you could say, well, why not give it into the veins, give a blood thinner into the veins? And we do have such blood thinners and we give them regularly. However, you can imagine, again, patients who have had maybe 20 minutes of CPR very often have rib fractures, lung fractures and uh, lung problems as a result of the CPR and we don't want bleeding and so the bleeding risk of giving blood thinners to cardiac arrest patients who have had CPR is really quite high so it just poses some extra challenges that we just need to be mindful of. Mm -hmm. Okay so if if you've uh, found that there is some something wrong with someone's um, arteries what what what's next? Yeah so Generally, we will see it on the moving X-ray. And then the standard way of treating these arteries would be to pass a wire, which is about the same diameter as a human hair on your head. So it's very fine. It's about 14 thousandths of an inch. And it's very soft and floppy in general and atraumatic. And we pass that down the artery as a sort of railroad. And then over that railroad, we pass usually a balloon and, and dilate up the narrowing, which has caused it, or try and unblock the blockage using a balloon first. That's called an angioplasty, isn't it? That's called a a plain old balloon angioplasty. That's correct. Uh, And we sometimes want to suck the clot out. If there's lots of clot in the artery, which can occur, then we would want to suck the clot out. And we use a sort of literally like a little hose pipe that just with a syringe that sucks out. And it's very effective at sucking out clot if there's lots of it. And finally, where we look at the narrowed artery and we think, we need to restore, if you like, the the, the, the true calibre of the artery because it's narrowed. Then we put a stent in, which is like a metal scaffold to hold open the artery so that it doesn't re-narrow or collapse back down again, which can happen if you just put a balloon into it. And that's what we've learned over the last sort of 25 years. And the stents and balloons that we use now really, really are very elegant devices and very low profile and the equipment we have does make our job an awful lot easier. Mm-hmm. Could you could you just describe what a stent is? Because you know, it, it's a, the, how you talked about the the thinness of the wire that you thread up, um, and, and in yes. my mind, arteries and veins aren't very big. So how, how do you actually get some metal tube, or what, or what is it? What, what's the what's it made out of, and, and what's it constructed like? So, as I say, the the stents are remarkably elegant. They are incredibly thin, strutted. Uh, So they are around 70 microns, which is a thousandth of a millimeter, a micron, I think, if I'm right. Uh, But they're they're very, very thin strutted. And they essentially form a sort of meshwork, I would say, that is 
crimped onto a balloon uh, and so that when the balloon goes up in the artery the mesh work is sort of uh, expanded uh, into the wall of the artery and literally pushes any clot cholesterol muck out of the way and then has the radial force to keep that artery open and stop it from renarrowing. And not only that, it has a drug on it which stops regrowth of the uh, endothelium and the myocytes into the uh, heart artery to renarrow it over the next year or so. So it's an incredibly elegant piece of equipment that we use, and that's partly why our results are now so good. It's a marvel of engineering, isn't it? But uh, do you know how they're made or...? Yeah, I do. So there's two different ways in which, and I've been to the factories, which are all in Galway in Ireland. Um, so there's two ways. So bear in mind, an average coronary artery is around about three millimeters in diameter. That's average. A very big coronary artery would be five millimeters, and a small coronary artery would be around two to two point two five millimeters. And stents come in 0.25 millimeter sizes, going from two up to five. Um, so there's two major ways in which you can make these stents. The first way is to have literally a three millimeter tube of cobalt chromium and then a very clever laser basically cuts out lots of holes and leaves you with a mesh which then puts is, is sort of crimped with a crimping machine on a balloon so that then when you position it in the right position, inflate the balloon, the mesh becomes three millimetres again and has the force of a tube like it started. So that's one way, and that's the majority of the stents are made in that way, two of the three major manufacturers. The third one, which has about, about a third of the business, is starts its life as a 75 micron straight piece of wire and by uh, hand is crimped into a zigzag type pattern. The zigzag pattern is then rolled onto a sort of mandrill, which is, of course, very, very small, around three millimeters. And then once it's rolled the zigzags onto the mandrill, the zigzags are then welded together with a spot welder. Uh, and then again, this stented segment is then put it on, onto a balloon before being crimped down and then when delivered, reinflated. So they are remarkable pieces of engineering. And bear in mind, this is all sterile. This is all deliverable, deliverable and bendy. And this also has a drug coating attached with a polymer often on the outside. So it's incredibly t advanced technology. Yeah, that's amazing. You, you said that some of it is done by hand. Is that, have they got, have they got so special the elves or leprechauns over there doing this? They have Oompa Loompas uh, who are paid. I don't know what they're paid, but um, no, it, it, there's 26 people involved in that particular stent by hand to make it. There is obviously some mechanistic bit what robots do in terms of it identifies by computer where the two zigzag crowns join and it puts a spot weld on them. That's not done by hand. Uh, but a lot of the uh, st st sterile stuff and a lot of the um, checking and ensuring quality is is done by human eye and human hand. It, it's quite phenomenal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it is phenomenal. And bear in mind, this is all for about two hundred and twenty pounds. Wow! So there is, yeah. It, so in the in Europe there and in Switzerland, and France, they go up to about a thousand euros. But in the UK, we somehow have driven the price down to about two hundred and twenty pounds. Mm -hmm. oh, superb. Um, so how long do these, these, uh, well, how long if you sort of just, um, balloon something out of the way that with the angioplasty, how long does that last and how long does a stent typically last as well? Yeah, so we tend not to just do balloon angioplasty anymore because it does re-narrow and at six months will be re-narrowed in around 30% of cases. So the re-narrowing rates are just too high. Um, with the stenting, the renarrowing rates at uh, sort of three years are around about 5%. And I think the key thing is with stents, because they are very elegant and sort of third generation devices now and very good and efficient at what they do. The key thing is that you implant them properly. And what that means is that you size it exactly spot on and that you really implant it into the wall of the artery and that no struts are kind of hanging in the flow because that can be when you run into problems with clots forming in months and years to come and stent failure mm -hmm. 
presumably the um, person's diet or some medications also need to be considered to help keep keep them clean. Yeah, that's absolutely right. So um, many of your patients who have had a heart attack as the cause of their cardiac arrest will almost invariably go home on aspirin with another antiplatelet agent that makes the blood less sticky, either clopidogrel, prasugrel, or ticagrelor. And uh, one of those with aspirin is very important to keep the blood less sticky for usually at least a year and sometimes longer. Uh, the um, statins, although the Daily Mail readers won't like those, they do have incredible uh, data to support benefits after a heart attack causing a cardiac arrest because it really does settle down the, uh, the, the inflammation and the cholesterol number itself, but also the deposition of cholesterol in your arteries and then the future risk of events of both stroke of heart attack and cardiovascular death. So statins are I would say probably the most important drug or certainly risk factor modification. And from our side, what that means is ensuring your cholesterol is well controlled, usually by a statin, but other medicines are coming through, uh, that you have your blood pressure well controlled, that your diet is well controlled, that you have as healthy a lifestyle as you possibly can, and that you exercise and do all the things that we know are good and avoid diabetes, which is absolutely uh, a killer long term mm -hmm. so all totally um understandable from what you're saying i mean w w when you're having these stents is there a limit to how how many people can have and is it yeah, no, i wouldn't say there, there's obviously a physical limit by how long your coronary arteries are um but in general um most arteries that you want to open you will be able to open with one to three stents if it's a very very long segment you might need th uh, two or three but at the same time the stents are coming in longer and longer uh, sizes so the longest size now is a 48 millimeter length so that's you know five centimeters and so two of those will cover most coronary arteries from top to bottom uh, and the shortest stent that, that they do is an eight millimeter. We tend not to use that very often because it can be quite easy to miss the problem. Uh, and the last thing you want to do is put a stent in and it is missed, um, you know, all of what you're trying to treat. So the shortest we tend to use day to day is either a 12 or a 15 mm -hmm. millimeter. Okay. And if if someone's got a stent in and then uh, it, it sort of clogs up again, uh, can you clean it, clean it out or what, what do you do? Can you replace it? Yeah, so generally, so I would go back to my original comment that if it's put in well, the chances of that are low, not, not zero, but are low. And especially when you're adherent to your tablets and all the other things of lifestyle. Um, but in general, if you are unlucky enough for it to re-narrow, it's usually a stable condition. And the way in which you treat it is to put a wire down just like you would before, know what it looks like from the angiogram and then uh, generally balloon it again and then use a drug coated uh, stent or a drug coated balloon to achieve the result that you want and we would tend to use a stent that has a different drug attached to it because if you've put it in well the first time and then you failed if you like your stent failed then there's no point in doing the same thing again because it might happen again so we try and mix up what we do to try and give again the patient the best possible long-term outcome mm -hmm. that sounds cool and to, um is does there come a time though where stents and angioplasty is just not going to cut it what what point do you say okay we need to go uh, a more invasive way perhaps with a bypass yeah no that happens in a small minority of patients but you're absolutely right i think it depends on the patient factors which include diabetes and the nature of what their disease looks like but you're right if stents just aren't working out, and we do see patients where stents just, it's very unusual, I think it's fair to say, but in, in recurrent stent failure, and if the anatomy is suitable and the patient is suitable, then you're absolutely right. One would need to consider, would they do better from a bypass operation? Uh, and that happens from time to time, but is not that common. Mm -hmm. So if someone's had, had these um, stents or an angioplasty, is there a sort of a, a post-procedure rehab that they need to do or is uh how soon can they sort of get back to 
to normal. I mean, I know we're talking about cardiac arrest patients, but say say someone was having one um, from an elective point of view. Yeah, so I did an elective one this morning. I think the way I, the way we deal with elective patients is, as you just point out, remarkably different to those who suffer heart attack or cardiac arrest. Um, the elective patients, let's say you had a 95% narrowing in an artery and every time you exercise, you get chest pain because of lack of blood supply to your heart at the term we would call angina. Um, you can imagine once you put a stent in successfully, push all that out of the way and there's then no narrowing, the patient's coronary artery and then blood supply has been in the best state it's been probably for five years before. So you can imagine you can do quite an accelerated rehabilitation program and get back to maybe doing stuff that you weren't able to do really quite quickly I would say as long as you're in good health otherwise and you're taking your tablets um, I think for heart attack and cardiac arrest there are very clearly defined rehabilitation programs which should really be adhered to you know in a much more slow and progressive and educated way with support from your cardiac rehab mm-hmm. team what about things like um, if you get an ICD, you have uh, sort of limitations on your driving. Are there any sort of limitations on driving or sports or flying? Yep. So there's, as you can imagine, depending on the indication and how poorly you were, there are different rules for different conditions. But if you put it in as a planned procedure electively for, uh, for angina, then patients cannot drive for one week. Uh, if you have it put in in the setting of a heart attack, then people generally can't drive for one month. And then, of course, there are a raft of other rules for people who have HGV licenses and other uh, taxi drivers, for instance. Um, so I think the key thing is, is there isn't one rule that fits everybody and you need to seek advice for when you can do certain things, depending on the situation in which your either device or your stent was implanted uh, and, and the clinical scenario that went along with that. That's really important because there are completely different rules for completely different uh, reasons to put things mm-hmm. in. And the, the other thing I sort of mentioned was sports. Is there anything that would say, you know, if you've got a certain number of uh, stents, can you still... Um be involved with contact sports say absolutely so you know the stents are very robust structures they sit within the heart wall of the wall of the heart artery and you know you imagine even if you've got a football or a cricket ball on the chest you've got a rib cage and ribs and muscle in between and 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 lots of other protective components that really do not make uh, a stent uh, at risk from anything from the outside world. I think it's very different to pacemakers and to defibrillators or CRT devices, which of course, you know, are, are much more affected by some direct trauma. You mentioned uh, ICDs and uh, CRTs. I mean, uh, I assume patients can have both with uh, with stents. Uh, absolutely. So, yeah, it's all really down to obviously the the distinct presentation of the patient, uh, but also down predominantly to the heart function in the cold light of day. So you could imagine that you have a heart attack causing a cardiac arrest. You get a stent in the first instance, which treats the problem that was underlying that brought you into hospital. But then a few weeks or months down the line, your heart function has not recovered to a certain level that then suggests you would benefit potentially from a CRT or an ICD type device, depending on your particular condition. So that's absolutely right. You could have had a stent in the first treatment, but then you may well benefit later on down the line from either a CRT or a defibrillator Mm -hmm. device. You you mentioned heart function. How, How do you measure how well a heart's performing? So most commonly, and in pretty much every cardiology department across the land, it will be measured by an ultrasound called an echocardiogram, uh, which, as many of you will know, is a, a jelly scan on the chest, put sort of in two positions on the chest, you're usually on your left-hand side. And ultrasound allows us to see the pump chamber, the left ventricle, and we look at the amount of blood it pumps out proportion of the size of the ventricle in every beat. And a normal heartbeat pumps out between 50 and 60 percent of the ejection fraction. So 50 to 60 is normal. Um, We get very worried about pump functions that are less than 35 percent. And often 
patients with less than 35% if they're uh, around three months from their uh, heart attack will potentially benefit from a CRT device, a resynchronization device, or potentially from a, uh, a defibrillator device to, to prevent arrhythmias and further sudden cardiac death at a later date. The other way of measuring heart function, uh, and many of your uh, listeners will have had this, is an MRI scan. And an MRI scan, if we're honest, is the gold standard. It looks at the heart muscle in beautiful definition. It is not reliant upon having what we call good echo windows because it takes slices of the heart and slices of the body so that we don't have to look through ribs and lung like we do with ultrasound on the outside of the chest. So it really does give us a beautiful set of images. And we look at the heart muscle too, which is incredibly uh, important. So I think that I would use echo as more of a screening tool. And then I often use MRI as, if you will, the gold standard. And it's available in pretty much every cardiac center mm -hmm. in the UK. That sounds cool. And just finally, um, what's the future of, of the cath lab and what goes on in the cath lab? Can we see sort of the, the need for perhaps um, bypasses or uh, more invasive procedures coming to the cath lab and being done up uh, a vein? Well, no, I don't think so. Not at the moment, not with the current technologies. I think that for me, if we're going to summarize the catheter lab, for me, the cath lab is where most patients are best assessed, uh, understand the reasons why they've had their cardiac arrest and offers potentially most of the treatments to make it better. Um, it relies on a multidisciplinary team. You have all of the tools that you might require to make the decisions to your hands, and you have all of the team members around you with all of those tools to safely do what you need to do. Uh, and I think that there is clearly a move towards patients coming to a cardiac centre straight from the community and bypassing local A&Es that might act as a triage. Now, occasionally A&Es do uh, have a useful role in terms of identifying non-cardiac causes of a cardiac arrest and therefore ones where the cardiac cath lab isn't going to make things better. For instance, intracranial bleeding. If someone has a big bleed into their brain and then collapses with cardiac arrest, of course, a cardiac catheterization lab is not going to make them any better. And actually, if we give blood thinners and anything else, could make them a lot worse. And so I think the key things that, that I think the listeners need to understand is the complexities of the medical problems that patients often present with and the complexities of the history that we may not have all of the history available to us. And we often have to make very uh, important decisions in a very short period of time, probably not having as much information as we really would like. Um, but I think that that's the nature of this uh, condition and hence why even more so centralizing this to get core levels of expertise in cardiac centers doing our center does 125 a year uh bristol i think does about 170 a year but doing high volumes makes us all better at what we do and if you have you know small volumes going to district general hospitals with a and e then one can imagine that they may have good outcomes and they maybe do some very very good work but it's highly likely that by centralizing uh centralizing cardiac arrests coming to catheter labs where they have the availability of all technologies and all treatments and all personnel on site 24 hours a day seven days a week is likely to improve outcomes i would then go slightly further and i think most of your listeners know my interest in follow-up of cardiac arrest patients again if you centralize cardiac arrests to a center it makes the follow-up potentially more easy to organize with skilled and expert expert people to support patients after their cardiac arrest accepting that geography can be a slight challenge uh, if they live maybe up to 50 miles away from the center and we fully understand mm -hmm. that. Well, it's been an incredibly informative uh, 45 minutes or so. Um, thank you very much for your your time and your expertise in 
and your expertise in relaying it in, in an understandable way as well because uh, I know it's a highly complex area and uh, you guys do amazing amazing work through a tiny little slit in the, someone's skin. So um, as I said earlier, my hat's taken off to you. So thank you very much for your time, Tom. And if anyone wants to uh, check out any of the other episodes that Tom's been in, there's lots to learn from those and there's lots to learn from a lot of the other episodes as well. And there's plenty of information on our website as well, suddencardiacarrestuk.org. So do check out that. And hopefully we'll speak to you soon, Tom. And thanks for again. Pleasure as always. Thanks. Thanks for your time.